Thank you all so much for coming out today. Uh, not surprisingly, we have a lovely crowd, a big crowd today, and we're very grateful for that. Uh, I want to thank our cookie ladies, Kathy and uh, Jean back there. Yes. And uh, I'd just like to say thank you again to the Elks for the, the gift that you all saw them present. And um, because so many of you know Ray Lutz, I wanted to tell you that Ray is the one who really orchestrates that, has for eight years, and he's been just really planning this. And I got a call this morning that right now he's in surgery. He's going to be fine, but he just couldn't get here. His pacemaker gave out yesterday. So um, he's fine, but um, if you don't know Ray, he's a fabulous volunteer here at the museum and a good friend. So um, we're sorry that he has to go through that, but we're grateful for modern medicine. Um, I've been watching those photos, and I was kind of disappointed because I didn't see any that I took. I was Ralph Palmer's <laughs> photographer for a while. <laughs> sure they, they, I was back in the black and white era, so I, <laughs> nobody wants to look at those old things anymore. Uh, but I certainly enjoyed the slideshow. That was really lovely. Uh, let's see, I have uh, two items of business. First of all, don't forget to turn off your cell phones, or at least turn off the ringer. And we have a new thing that we're going to be doing every brown bag. We're going to be passing this around every time. And it's really important. We're just asking you for your name. And the most important thing is your zip code. Because actually, the County Convention and Visitors Bureau provides us with a lot of marketing money. And we, uh, and the County Commissioners, and uh, we want to make sure that we know where you're coming from because they want to know about all the people who come in from outside Stark County. So if you would be kind enough to sign this, if it somehow misses you, let's see, how are we going to do this? I'm gonna, I see, we've got somebody raring to go over here. <laughs> Linda, hi! <laughs> and um, I said, oh, a pen. I have a pen. It's in my pocket. <laughs> Please, please do that, and Stephanie will be at the door as you leave. So if you fail to sign, if it misses you, then um, please catch her at the door. Uh, okay, that's enough business. I want to um, tell you about a couple of really exciting things coming up Tuesday, March 3rd. History Discussion Group and Mandy will be helping Chris with that. I think it's one that you won't want to miss. It's a virtual Main Street Mansion tour. Another Mandy, in other words, Mandy will be showing um, images up here, and then the discussion group will talk about them. So it'll be like going on a walking tour in the comfort of your chair, not in the of so you And Saturday, March 14th, it's a big day around here because that's the dedication of this whole wonderful expansion project. So please join us then. It's from 11 to 2, and it's free, and of course we'll have food, and um, it, it's just, it, there'll be uh, remarks in the ribbon cutting at noon. Um, you've all seen a lot of the first floor, except maybe the ceramics room, which is, uh, kind of anchors that corner of the building. Uh, the second floor will be much fuller of uh, exhibitions and uh, the wonderful things that you haven't been able to see for so long because now we have 47% more gallery space. So uh, you want to, that day, not today, that day you want to come back and see the new galleries and of course the Paul Brown Museum. And the lower level has new classrooms, which you probably haven't seen, and a sensory room. Next Brown Band Lunch is March 24th and I think you will enjoy that one too. It's uh, MJ Albacetti, and he will be talking about the central figures of the Stark County Courthouse pediment. So it's like the sculptures that are over the doorway of the county courthouse. So I think that would be a really interesting program. Y'all loved him when he was here back in 2003. Okay, it's time to introduce our speaker. We have Richard Regula. He's president of the Board of Stark County Commissioners. He uh, says his community involvement was inspired, of course, by his father, Congressman Ralph Regula, and his My mother. mother. I, I, was <laughs> oh, I was not going to forget Mary Regula. <laughs> and, and you know she founded uh, the National First Ladies Library. 
Um, and you will see what a strong influence they had as I tell you about his accomplishments. He's a graduate of Fairless High School and Ohio University. He began his career with Regular Brothers Transport, which became our Strauss LLC, in 2009 when he became the owner. He's a member of the Stark Tuscarawas Wayne Joint Solid Waste Management District Board. Ooh, I hope you don't have to say that very often. Um, and a governing um, board member of the Carroll Columbiana and Stark Regional Transportation Improvement Project. Whew, um, those sound like big names, but what things he accomplishes for us, um, especially in extending Route 30. Yes. This has been a lifelong dream. I would even meet him to the punch on Route 30. And he talks about it every time he speaks. <laughs> Um, that's huge for the development in our area. He serves on the board of the YMCA of Western Stark County and is the legislative, legislative vice president of the Mass and West Stark Chamber of Commerce. In the past, he served as president of the Rotary Club of Masson and as a member of the Ohio and Erie Canal Corridor Committee. I hope you'll be talking about the, the towpath and the importance your family and the, the trail are. Uh, he served on the board of directors uh, for the Stark County Farm Bureau on the Navarre Village Council, three terms as Bethlehem Township trustee, and on the Clean Ohio Council. I think he's uh, paying his dues, um, that community service that his parents taught him, and I think he'll tell you more about the influence they had on him. Richard. Thanks, Marty. Thank you. Here today, and I want to thank Mrs. Gessner and the Gessner Family Foundation for this lovely facility here at the Madison Museum. A couple things before you yes, give them a couple things you want to, before I get started. There's a couple people I want to introduce. First of all, I want to introduce Abby Honecker, who is from the Regula Center over at Mount Union College, and I'll tell you the story about how mom and dad met at Mount Union and, and uh, dad's involvement with the Regula Center. But I also want to introduce my sister, Martha. Martha, stand up here. And Martha is going to be our fact checker for today. So if anything, if I said anything, it's not, not necessarily to, to complete facts. My sister will make sure that I know about it. But what I thought I'd do is start out and just give you a little background about my mom and dad and how they met and uh, how this whole story got started, I guess I would say. Uh, my parents, uh, my dad grew up on a farm in Beach City with the younger brother John, and because in, back in World War II they did not draft people off the farm, he knew he was not going to necessarily, he probably wouldn't get drafted, but he decided if he was ever going to have, and, and this is a 19 year old kid, he decided if he was ever going to have any sort of political experience, he should get some military experience, so he enlisted in the Navy in World War II. As a, you know, the war was rolling on, he, he was working his way toward the Naval Academy, he had tested into the Naval Academy, and the night before he was supposed to start, he got cold feet, called his CO up and said, I don't want to go. CO goes, no problem, soldier number 201 will gladly take your place. So he didn't go. He would have been in Jimmy Carter's class of 200. And now that you know, I'll touch on that when we get to the Carter years. So he didn't go. He comes back to the farm in Beach City. He was walking down the street. He was going to either go to Miami or Otterby, I believe. And there was a fellow who came up to him and said, Ralph, I know you want to stay close to the farm, why don't you go over to Mountain Union and check out Mountain Union and the Alliance? So he decided to go over to Mountain Union, enrolled at Mountain Union, fell in love with the school. My mother, who grew up a first generation immigrant, who was the former Mary Roguski in Girard, Ohio, had no means of going to college. But she had an English teacher that said, Mary, I'm going to get you a scholarship. And the only place she could get to on the bus was Mountain Union. And that's how they met. They met at Mount Union College. My mom always said, that, you know, she grew up in Girard, which is in the Mahoney Valley. And she said, you know, your dad was the first live Republican I ever met. <laughs> I said, Mom, did you know any dead ones? She goes, no, I didn't know any dead ones either. And, but I, I really think that, you know, Mom was a lifelong Democrat, even though, you know, as dad's political career unfolded, I'm sure she became a registered Republican. But that kept in balance. But, I, you know, I always say I would have loved to have been in the car because they, traveled together and, and you know they were inseparable so they meet at Mount Union College when mom passed away with my sister to her credit went through the attic and found a, a lot of really interesting things but one of the things they found was a green shirt a green wool shirt and in the pocket was a note from my mother that said 
this is a shirt your dad wore when we met at Mount Union College. <laughs> and then we find, ended up finding all the love letters that uh, dad wrote to mom when he was courting her back in the day. And uh, it was really kind of cool. He, he had his challenges because one, mom wanted to be a school teacher. That's all she wanted to be. She wasn't interested in getting married to some guy from Beach City, Ohio, in all places. <laughs> But, uh, you know, Dad continued to he put the full court press on her. They had some other issues because Mom was a very devout Catholic, and Dad was, I believe, Methodist. Back then, you didn't mix, mix religions. But he, and, and we found the love letters that he wrote to her, and, and he just kept, you know, pushing and pushing, and, and finding the last love letter that we found. And Dad said to Mom, he says, Mary, if you marry me, I'll hold your hand for the rest of your life. She married him, and she held his hand, and he hers for the rest of their life the day he died. So they get married at Mount Union College. Uh, Grandpa bought him a farm down outside of the bar, and I still remember Mom said when Dad brought her down to that farm, and he, you know it was just a basically a two-story building, and you know the barn and the summer kitchen, and it had no basement. And this that she cried for months because they were, she was a city girl that did not want to live on this godforsaken farm. But Dad, you know, kept kept working at it, and so they got they came back, and, and Mom started teaching school, and Dad was teaching school at uh, Prairie College, and then in, in Justice in uh, Sandy Valley, he was the principal over at Justice, and then he went to law school at night, and he got his degree from the William McKinley School of Law. And one of the interesting stories when once Dad graduated from uh, from uh, law school, he was a solicitor in the village of the bar. Then Governor Rhodes called up the village and said, do you want the canal lands that are in, inside the village? They were going to give the canal lands away to the adjacent property owners. And, and Dad convinced then Governor Rhodes to give it to the county commissioners. And that's how the county commissioners ended up with the canal lands. It all we became the towpath trail, trail that we, and, and I want to encourage everybody to please get out and support issue 20. It's uh, no new taxes and it's just a renewal levy. But that was one of the, and he'll, he'll tell you that was one of his greatest accomplishments was the Topaz Trail. So then he started working as, uh, he was elected, uh, the only race he ever lost was a uh, race that he ran for a state school board in the 16th district. But after that, he was elected to the state house in 64. He was elected to the state senate in 68. They worked on some instrumental things with it. then uh, uh, Governor Rhodes. Uh, he was the founder of Stark State College because one, when they passed the legislation to build the interstate system, that they, Dad got him convinced to put uh, money into it for a bond issue to build Stark State. And then he was one of the founders of uh, Neil Med College, and that's a great story too, because then Governor Rhodes wanted, they said they were gonna build a college, a medical school somewhere, and all the, you know, the Akron's and Kent State's and Cleveland State University, everybody wanted it. And then, so Dad got all the presidents in the room one night, and he had the, down at the farm in Navarre, he pulled out a map, and he goes, we're gonna put it right in the middle, Rootstown. That's how Neil Med got to be, got to Rootstown. <laughs> So, Dad was elected to Congress in 1972. Where's Mandy at? Where's the flipper at? Whoop, whoop. Okay. Dad was elected to Congress in 1972, and I, I still remember the, the, that election because he took over for Frank T. Bo, and everybody remembers Frank T. Bo's slogan. It was Frank T. Bo, the man you know. And so, Dad uh, ran a great campaign, and I tell you, the, the key people in my, in my father's campaign is my mom, and my Aunt Rhea, they were the regular girls, and some of you might remember them. They traveled around the county, and, and Mom, when Dad couldn't give a speech, Mom started filling in, and, and she started the Mary Todd Lincoln speeches that uh, really, you know, was kind of the, the infamous, I guess I would say, is to get the whole First Ladies Library thing moving forward later in her career. And so Dad was elected to Congress in uh, 1972. He took office in, in 1973, and that's when, uh, the first president he started serving with was uh, Richard Nixon. And here's kind of the timeline that, you know, when, when he graduated, when they were married, and, and when he was elected to, to Congress, and then uh, in 98, we'll talk about that a little bit later, the first lady library. So let's go on to President Nixon. When Dad was elected, President Nixon was re-elected. And the story, and there's, a, it, there's Dad's quote on that, but the story I remember about Nixon, because I was about like a sophomore or junior in high school, the day Nixon resigned because he got caught up in the whole Watergate scandal, Dad had received death threats. 
So I'm driving home one night from uh, high school, and I go whipping in the garage in my 1963 Dodge, and I jump out of the car, and here's all these sheriff's deputies with their guns out. They go, what are you doing here? I go, I live here. <laughs> so they let, you know, they let me in, and, and then, you know, on, on, on we, uh, Nixon ended up designing, and that's when Gerald Ford became president. Now, Dad and Gerald Ford had a relationship because when Gerald Ford was in the State House of Michigan and Dad was in the State House of Ohio, they served on a, on a steel caucus together. And that's when they started really building their relationship. And then when Ford becomes, uh, before that, even when Dad, um, Ford was the minority leader in the House, and I remember it because when Dad took the oath of office in 1973, I was like 14 years old or something like that, and you couldn't go on the floor of Congress and take the oath with your parent unless you were up 12 or under. So I'm down there going, like, you know, I'm only 14. Come on, man, let me in. And so Dad goes, hold on. So he goes in and gets them minority for leader Ford. Ford comes out and gives the guys a high sign. And then I went, and so I took the oath, oath of office with Dad. When the, when uh, Dad was in the, still in the house, or in, when uh, President Ford was still in the house. He put that on appropriations. His dad always said that they ever wants to have the checkbook. Mm -hmm. he, he was the first uh, congressman from the 16th district on appropriations since uh, William McKinley. And that was a key appointment for dad. And then the other thing that kind of built his bipartisanship was that Tip O'Neill, who was the, the speaker then, because the Democrats were in control of the House, Tip O'Neill kind of took him under his wing. I think he liked my mom then more than he liked my dad just because of her background. And, they being good Catholics, they always had to go to church when they were on the trips. But they used to go on the speaker's trip every spring, and on the speaker's speak, uh, trip. And it was, it was really kind of cool, because he got all these real cool Nike bags. And I still have the one that said the speaker's trip to the USSR, so that, that was kind of cool. And, uh, so, but that built his bipartisanship. That built his uh, relationships with you know, both sides of the aisle. And, and today, that is a, you know, obviously a, a lost cause, but then, so after Gerald Ford, and, and, and he ended up losing that that race to um, to Jimmy Carter, and Dad, you know, of course, I, I told you about the story with Dad, and with uh, Jimmy Carter, that they would have been in the same class together. Dad, he, I don't think he really had that. He had a working relationship, Dad, and of course, Dad, you know, he was young in his career, so he he was kind of moving their way up, and you know, the, the economy was having its challenges. But he worked with Rosalind Carter, and that's when, you know, we, that was even before he was the head of the National Park Service, to get the uh, boyhood, home, boyhood home of uh, Jimmy Carter into the National Park Service. And Rosalind Carter was ever, you know, forever grateful to that. And, you know, one of the things Dad did later on in his career, he worked, worked with Coretta Scott King to get the Martin Luther King home within the National Park Service. And he actually served on the Martin Luther King Commission, and, and him and Coretta had a a very good relationship together. You know, we just celebrated the holiday. In fact, I think he, he wrote some of the, he wrote the legislation that created the national ho holiday on a bipartisan basis. So, so then we move on to my favorite president, uh, Ronald Reagan. Now, this is a great story. Here I am in 1981, and I'm out in D.C. Dad goes, well, "Why don't you come over to the White House and we'll get a picture with Reagan?" I go, "Okay, that sounds like a great idea to me." You know, I had this. Well, you can see my bad haircut and everything else I had going on there. I had a mullet before mullets were cool, but that's a whole other story. So I'm sitting in the green room with Boom Boom Mancini, the boxer from Youngstown, in Miss America 1981. So I'm trying to chat it up with Miss America. It wasn't going real well. She was a Mormon from Utah. That's a whole other story. So out of, you know, out of the old office, here comes Greg. And so Dad gives me a high sign. What do you say to the leader in a free world? I said, hey, Mr. President, I said, we could have used you down on the farm building fence, because I knew we had that ranch in California. He goes, really? He goes, what kind of fence are you boys building? I said, oh, just some cedar fence to keep the, keep the horses in. He goes, well, you know what? We build a fence out of telephone poles in California. I go, really? I go, where'd you get the poles at? He goes, old California power had a few laying around. <laughs> so anyhow, we take the picture, and on his way he goes. A couple weeks later, Dad ran into him, and I think that was on Air Force One, or ran into him somewhere, and the president comes up and he says, Hey, Ralph, how's your fence coming? He goes, Well, to be honest with you, Mr. President, I really don't know how to build it. He gets, two weeks later, in the, in the original notes back there in the display case, he gets a handwritten note from Reagan explaining how they build this fence. And what they do is, telephone poles are big on the bottom, and they're made out of pine, and then they narrow up. 
So you cut the bottoms on the creosote so they won't rot. So you cut the bottoms off and use those for a post, and then you bolt and notch them together in, with, with the top sort of rails. So anyhow, if you next time you drive down uh, State Route 21, there's the old schoolhouse at the end of the, the farm lane of, of Mom and Dad's. All that fence is breaking fence because AEP had a few poles laying around. <laughs> so they had this correspondence back and forth. In the last letter he got from Dad, and it's, it's in the back too, there's a handwritten note that says, congratulations, you graduated summa cum laude in fence building. <laughs> that's, that's just the kind of guy that, uh, that President Reagan was, and, and they had a, a great relationship. And I, and I think that's, and you know, and Reagan was a, worked on both sides of the aisle. He was big buddies with Tip O'Neill, and, 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 but I think that whole farming background and that, that really built that relationship between Dad and, and, uh, and Ronald Reagan. And then we go on to H.W. H. W. Bush. Now, Dad had a relationship with, well, I, let me back up a little bit, that same day that we took the picture with Reagan, Dad goes, why don't we go over and see the Vice President? I said, okay, Dad, that sounds like a good idea, too. So we go over there, and we sat in Vice President Bush's office for like an hour, and the phone didn't ring, he had nothing on his desk, I think he was waiting for a state funeral, if it had nothing else. So anyhow, uh, after Reagan retired, then H.W. Uh, Bush was elected, and Dad and him had a relationship because they served in Congress together. And that's when they really started building their relationship. And Dad had the ultimate admiration for H.W. Bush. He always said if he would endeavor mouth the, the words, uh, read my lips, no new taxes, and then that he would have been reelected for a second term. And Dad thought he would be a great president. The night, you know, that read my lips, no new taxes, the night that tax bill came up for a vote, Dad got a phone call from the White House. They said, well, you're in, a, you're in with us on this, aren't you? And he goes, no, I, I just I can't support it. I'm sorry to say I cannot vote for it. And they said, well, you know, Congressman, you know those four tickets you have for the Kennedy Center tomorrow night? You no longer have. <laughs> and, and here, Dad had donated those to the, uh, uh, the Angel Auction for Altman Hospital, and so he had to go out and scramble to, to a ticket master or whoever it was then to get the four tickets to, uh, you know, to, to get the, the people to the uh, Kennedy Center. And the day after that happened, he got a call from H.W. Bush and said, Ralph, I'm sorry that ever happened, and that, that person that did that is no longer on my staff. So that's the kind of straight-up guy H.W. Uh, Bush was. And, and I'll, I'll never forget the, the day, uh, or a couple days after Dad passed away, I received a phone call because I was taking on a cause for the family, and it said Houston, Texas. So I picked it up, and the gal goes, this is uh, President Bush's office. He'd like to talk to you. I go, well, I'll certainly take his calls. <laughs> and, and, but he was very gracious. He just wanted to pass on his condolences to the family. You could tell he was getting a little frail. And, and uh, but that's just the kind of guy he was, and that's the kind of guy Dad was, and that's why they had such a, a good relationship with them. And, um, you know, I, you can't say enough about a guy like uh, George H.W. Bush. On to Bill Clinton. Now, Dad and Bill Clinton, I, you know, of course, they obviously had a working relationship, and, and I'm sure there's some correspondence at the radio center and phone. But the most important thing about Bill Clinton was his wife Hillary, and him and his wife Hillary, their relationship on the National First Ladies Library. My mom, going back, I, I think I mentioned it before, when she was out giving speeches, and, and especially when Dad got to Congress, when she filled in for him. She developed this speech, and, and Martha, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was about Mary Todd Lincoln. And Mary Todd Lincoln, and she'd go to the Rotary Clubs and the various clubs, and, and I think she even started dressing up as, as part of it. And so she came up with the idea, as Mom always said, you know, they build shrines for football players. There should be a shrine for first ladies. And it was her idea and her idea alone, along with uh, Sheila Fisher here locally, to come up with the, the National First Ladies Library. They uh, convinced, uh, I believe it was uh, Marsh Bellum who gave them that building downtown, which is where, where of course, the Saxton House is very famous because that's where McKinley used to do his uh, stump speeches. And I think Ida Saxton McKinley, that was her childhood home, I believe. And, and so that, that, uh, but that relationship that Mom built with Hillary Rodham, when it came to dedicating the library building, the only one that really took any interest in it, and I'm not sure of all the first ladies who was alive and who wasn't, but was Hillary Rodham Clinton. And she graciously came out to the, uh, 
you know, the, the dedication of the First Lady's Library, and I still remember it, because Mom, the night before, she calls up and says, hey, you and your brother want to drive the press corps in the, in the motorcade. I said, haven't been in a motorcade before. I said, yeah, that sounds like a great idea to me. So we pick her up, and, and Hillary Rodham Clinton was the most gracious lady ever wanted to meet. We pick them up at the airport, and we had these two white vans, and so we're going down the motorcade down in 77, and it was pretty cool being in a motorcade, don't get me wrong. And so she did the dedication, and so, and I, I sometimes hesitate when I tell this story, but now Hurricane said it was okay, go ahead. And, and uh, so she did the uh, dedication to the library, and she goes, I want to make, uh, put a wreath on McKinley's grave. So okay, sounds like a great idea, let's do it. So we go up, whipping up that back road behind the McKinley Monument. I don't know if you're, sometimes it's chained off, but we go whipping up that back road. Well, here's a guy and a gal, I think we're up there parking. And so all of a sudden you see a couple heads pop up and then Sierra Service Drive jumps out of the car and goes, you're going to have to move these vehicles. He goes, no problem, officer, we were just getting ready to wave. And so, so Hillary Rodden does the, uh, lays a wreath on the uh, grave, and then we go back to the airport. And we were all taking pictures with her. My brother, and don't ask me why, so my brother was enthralled with her, uh, the perf perfume she was wearing that day. So he didn't just give her a kiss on the cheek, he gave her a kiss on the lips. <laughs> and the next thing, that, I guess like two weeks later, that Hillary came up to dad, she goes, tell that son of yours that the perfume I was wearing was such and such. <laughs> so he was wondering what that perfume was. So that, uh, and, and I tell you what, uh, you know, mom's, dedication and perseverance of getting that library done, getting that library done in Canton, Ohio, and, and you know, where it should should be, was, it was all her. I, I mean, I remember dad to tell her, no, I don't know if that's gonna happen, Mary, and then mom would go, oh, oh yeah, Ralph, it, it's gonna happen. And she went door by door, and company by company, she raised, I don't know how many millions of dollars to fund the whole First Lady's Library, but that was her mission. In life, and to the day she died, she tell you that was her greatest accomplishment, and that's just it, 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 because it brought back the educate, educator in her. It, talk, it brought back the love of history with all the first ladies' library, and it needed to be done. There, there's no question about it; it needed to be done. So on we go now to George W. Bush, and this is a, I, I remember. Uh, w. Bush, I, I think I met him once, but the, you know, it was getting kind of later in, in Dad's career, and um, you know, they, they just uh, they had a good good working relationship, and I guess there was some, uh, some uh, proclamations and things that Dad got done when he was in the still in the, in the house, obviously, in, in honor of Mount Union winning one of their uh, football uh, national championships, and you know, they've won quite a few since then. But, you know, looking back on Dad's career, there was a, a couple of things that, I mean, especially for Western Star County, that were, you know, I, I told you about the Towpath Trail and how that got, got started with him and saving it and giving it to the county commissioners. But when he gets to Congress in 74 and 5, him and John Cyberwing, on a bipartisan basis, passed the legislation that bought the five farms that ultimately became the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. Then President Ford was going to veto the bill because they did not want to take on any new parkland. It was the first national park, east rural national park, urban national park, east of the Mississippi. So Ford was going to veto the bill. Dad got wind of this. He called up uh, Ray Bliss, who was a very prominent Republican. Bliss called Ford at his condo in Bale and said, you veto this bill, you're going to lose Ohio. So uh, Ford signed the bell, still lost Ohio, but the rest of the rest is history. So, and, and, you know, and I mentioned uh, Neo Med and the Topaz Trail and the First Lady's Library, but one of the things I, I always loved about Dad is uh, he was so grounded. I mean, he, he was just a farm boy from Beach City. When, the, amongst the letters that we found, we found the letters that he wrote home in the World War II talking to his mom and dad, and, and it, it, you could see the love of the farm. All he was worried about was the farm. The greatest thing was these letters were addressed, Mom and Dad, Beach City, Ohio. That's it. And then he somehow got there. And, and it just talked about leading up to going to Naval Academy and not want to come become a career politician or a career military guy. And that's why he just decided that he didn't want to go and, and he wanted to come back to, to Beach City and, and uh, 
you know, that kind of the rest is history. But they never, they had a place in, in the, a condo in D.C. that they bought in 73. Dad always goes, you know, the one mistake I made, I didn't buy enough real estate when I was out there. They <laughs> bought a little house, it's a, you know, like 900 square feet for $53,000, now it's worth like 450 or something like that. So. But they, they always traveled back and forth. They never stayed on, we, the, the kids, could my, my, I, I was the youngest, but my mom waited to the two years till I went away to the college, and, and, uh, and they, they just traveled back and forth. They'd come home every weekend. As I always said, the, when the bell would ring in D.C., Dad came home. And he never got caught up in everything that was going on out there. You know, obviously he was a pretty powerful man at, at the, uh, toward the end, you know, and his, and it was very certain. 36, you know, 18 terms, 36 years in Congress. He was one of the cardinals that they called him because he was, a, you know, head of one of the appropriations subcommittee which dealt with all the national parks. He'd tell you his greatest disappointment was when he was in line to become chairman of appropriations, the most powerful committee in Congress. And so the Republicans had taken over with Newt Gingrich and the contract with America. And they, they came down to two people. It was Jerry Lewis, not the comedian, but Jerry Lewis, the congressman from uh, California, who was the head of the uh, uh, Defense uh, Department, and Dad, who was the head of the uh, Department of Interior. And so what the Republican caucus said, they said, you guys go out, whoever raises the most money, because they retain control, you gotta raise money. So they went out and, and started raising money. And Dad was never a, a, a big fundraiser. I mean, he raised enough. His first campaign, I think he ran for $50,000 or under. You know, now they spend, I think Renee Seen Sutton spent like $25 million or some crazy number to get elected. And that's part of the problem in politics. Mm -hmm. But so he did, he did his part. He raised about $3 million bucks. The day the Committee on Committees met to decide who was going to be chairman of appropriations, Jerry Lewis circulated the memo and said, I'll raise $25 million in the next two years. Game over, because Dad could not raise that kind of money. And, you know, I always say Jerry had an advantage because he was shaking down uh, shipbuilders, and Dad, it's hard to shake down a tree. Unless you want to get <laughs> so, so, that, and so what happened was that uh, uh, Jerry becomes chairman of appropriations, and started, in order to start raising that money, he sent his lieutenants out, and they started selling him federal earmarks. And, and you know, the earmarks have kind of got a, I don't want to say a bad word, but you know, people talk all about these earmarks. You want to talk about earmarks in Stark County? You look at the uh, YMCA down in the bar. That was a three million dollar federal earmark. That when we built that, and then when, when the when the library library was put in, and the healthcare provider was put in, we could have never done it without that federal earmark. And now it's, I was just in there this morning. I mean, people love it. I thought that thing was the field of dreams, but uh, people love it and support it. And, and you know, they built, he got a federal earmark for a cath lab at the ED at, uh, at Mercy Medical Center, the regular center over at Mount Union. And Dad did things the right way, and he did things on a bipartisan basis. And one of the, the relationships he was had was with Nancy Pelosi. <coughs> Uh, Nancy, when she was when she wasn't speaker then, but when she was in the state house, in her district was the Presidio, Presidio Air Base. I think it was either an air or naval base, and uh, the federal government was going to was going to close it. Then Governor Willie Brown said, "Well, let's turn it into a homeless shelter, which they could probably use now." But that's a whole other story. Dad, Nancy convinced Dad to put the Presidio in the National Park Service, and that's how it became a national park. And if that wanted to happen. It would have been either a homeless shelter or things like that. Dad loved the national parks. I mean, he loved traveling around the country. I think he probably set foot or had a hand in every national park in, in, in the country. Uh, when we were, I mean, and thanks to the regular center, when we were cleaning out all this stuff after mom passed away, I mean, he had more ranger hats and plaques and you know, everything from around the, around the country, but that's, he just loved it. I mean, he loved nature, and that's why he. You know, that, I think that goes back to his uh, basis of growing up on the farm, and uh, he never lost lost that. He never lost that love of nature. I, I tell you, my fondest memories when we were kids. We lived on a 180 farm, 180 acre farm down just south of the bar. Was uh, building trails. We built a lot of trails back in the woods, and uh, we had horses, and we had chickens. And, we were very involved in 4-H, and that just, that's what Dad instilled in me is, is that, that, you know, that 
that heritage, I guess I would say. And, and then, of course, it, it continued on in, in public service, because I could see how much Dad liked helping people, and that, that's, you know, the reason I got involved with it is just, you know, to help people and make Stark County a, a better place to, to live and work. And uh, I still remember when Dad retired, uh, the one fellow goes, hey, Congressman, you got to go down to Florida for your retirement? And he goes, no, nope, my golf cart's a John Deere. <laughs> so, he, that's, and he, he, loved, he just loved being out on the farm and loved Paul Manure, as he always said, you know, we do a lot of that in Washington, but he said, I like doing it here on the farm. And, and I still remember the, about a, a week or so before he passed, you know, he was sitting in, in, the, uh, in the kitchen looking out, my brother was cleaning the barn out or moving hay or something. You could just tell by looking at him that, you know, he missed it so much. And that, it's just, that's, I think he, he realized that, you know, he wasn't going to be able to do that anymore because of his, his, you know, he had some issues with his ankles and things like that. But that's, that's just, you know, he passed away in a, in a peaceful manner, and as did my mom. And they were holding hands when they passed away. So that's, that's the story. I, I mean, I'm, I don't know what the, how I'm doing on time. Am I doing okay? Yeah. yeah, yeah. If there's any any sort of questions or anything, I, I mean, it's hard to put a dad's life in, in a, a half hour, forty five minute uh, the presentation. But uh, I'll tell you what, he, like I said, he was just a, they were great big parents. I mean, I, I was truly, uh, truly blessed. Any questions? Yes, sir. What's the story of the schoolhouse? The schoolhouse was actually owned by Harvey Schrock, who was the neighbor across the street. His uh, granddaughters, uh, Jane and Mary Schneider, still own the schoolhouse. Back in the day, Harvey tore one side out and was storing machinery in it. And we used to sit down there at the end of the driveway. I shouldn't probably tell this, but we used to chuck rocks through the windows because all the windows were broken out and everything. So Harvey, and I, I think it was more his, uh, his um, granddaughters, Mary and Jane, they completely restored the building. It was an old schoolhouse, and so there was a desk in there and the, the chalkboards, and but they, they still own it, and they restored it. My brother uh, got the, the, the farm, and because Dad wanted the, the farm to remain a farm, and much like my Uncle John's place over at Beach City that my cousin Tim has, and they, they're still raising cattle, and, and it, it's still an operating farm, and, and uh, I'm still in the milk hauling business. My dad and my uncle John got in, in the milk hauling business, and we all, Mike and I, had some Smuckies milk for 50 plus years. Um, that, you know, dad would always tell the story about, you know, we used to haul cow milk. I go, well, good for you, dad. That's why your calves are probably so bad. <laughs> they got started in the milk hauling business in 1948, and uncle John kept it going, and I'm still in it as, as now. So. How much <coughs> Oh, and it's schoolhouses, and there's only a couple acres there. And then Harvey's Farm is across the street. So, but that was always, yeah, that was always the neighbor's. So it's the regular homestead in the back? Yeah, that's in the back. Yeah. yeah. That's one that, and that's a great story. My grandpa was driving over to buy a farm for Dad, and Dad was in the, in the war. And so uh, Grandpa had a, a place picked out, and in fact, it was the old Appleby Farm, if anybody knows, out on Full Road outside of the bar. And on the night, that either the day of, he was going to head over, Grandma was painting cupboards or something, and she had a newspaper out and said, Hey, Ralph, uh, why don't you, uh, or, or Oscar, my grandpa, he goes, Hey, Oscar, why don't you look at this farm down uh, just south, south, south of Navarre, 21, the Kai Keith farm. So Dad stopped there first, ended up buying the farm, because I think he loved the woods, or Grandpa stopped there first, and ended up buying the farm, and then when Dad uh, got out of college, he came back there, and that's, they lived there their whole lives. And so it's now it's going to be it's going to remain in the regular family for generations. How many acres? He's got like three hundred. Yeah. So, quite any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Tell you my favorite Ralph and Mary story. 
we, um, they were at St. Timothy's with me, and I was the first woman to um, serve communion at St. Timothy's Church, and I stood up front with the chalice, and no one came to my side of the church. Everyone, everyone went to the other side, and mercifully, Ralph and Mary, holding hands, came from the back row, it wasn't their turn to come up for communion, and they marched up the left side and took communion from me. <laughs> you know, Dad, I always said, always had vision. And I think when he was uh, in the State House and State Senate, he decided that if he was ever going to run for Congress, he had to make friends in, in Wayne County. So instead of going to church at St. Timothy's, which we all we ended up going to church at St. Timothy's, we went to church in St. Mark's in Worcester. And that's when he met uh, Stanley Gaunt and all the people from Worcester. Now, I remember it because we used to stop at the Howard Johnson's. It was just on the east side of Worcester when we were going back and forth, and I got the clam strip. So that's a, I was all in for the right over there. Clam strips. Since we've been talking about legislative things, I do want to tell you that you might have noticed that Alex and Scott are not here today, and that's because it's Museum's Advocacy Day. And so they are in Washington, D.C., in Ralph Regula's former office, meeting with Congressman Gonzalez and advocating not just for our museum, but for all museums. So uh, they were sorry to miss this, certainly sorry, but uh, I think you can agree that it's very important that they're there. I want to thank you all so much for coming, and I suspect you'll be willing to answer questions if you were too shy to ask in front of everybody else. Thank you all so much for coming. See you next month.